Hi, welcome to 45th Street. I hope you've come here looking to learn more about the Lord. It's my prayer that something that will be said on this channel will give you more of a desire to be a part of his church family. I invite you to come visit us at our physical location at 7600 Division Avenue, so over in the East Lake community, or you can continue to find out more about us at 45bc.org. Well, here comes the sermon. My prayer is that it's a blessing to you. God bless you, and take care. Good job, good job, good job, good job. Good job. <laughs> We've been, um, working in a sermon series the last few weeks entitled Things That Can Destroy Your Marriage. Things That Can Destroy Your Marriage. <clears throat> By way of recap, we started out the very first week talking about how we can get into a mode of thinking in our relationships, whether we're married or not married, whether we're anticipating being married, whether we've been married before and it didn't go the way we thought it would. But at some point in the relationship, our marriage becomes one wherein we get used to leftovers. Leftovers. Leftovers from our otherwise busy lives. I think we universally agree that that's not a good place to be, to just be getting leftovers in your relationship. And that we have to do some things to encourage and, and strengthen our relationship. I think the most significant thing that came out of that message was <clears throat> to make sure we change the order of the nature of the word love. We change it from being a noun to being a verb. And that means you have to make sure that love is not something you find. Love is something you do. Love is something to do, you do. And then we went on in the last message and we talked about how dangerous it can be when our expectations are not met in relationships. When we set one another up for a let down when our expectations are not being met. In fact, we all come into relationships with expectations. He's gonna look like this, he's gonna do these things, she's gonna be this way, she's gonna be able to cook, and she will. All these things come in, and when those things don't happen, it sets us up for problems. And so we talked about how to deal with expectations being a problem for us. Today we're going to introduce another topic that I believe may be the poison pill of relationships. I think it's, it's easy to say, without a doubt, that our topic today is a problem for a whole lot of folk. Whole lot of folk. Today we're gonna to talk about the thing that can destroy your marriage is a failure to forgive. Failure to forgive. Failing to forgive is a problem of massive proportions. Massive proportion. Oftentimes, we relegate the problems we have in our relationships to just what happens in our relationships. But the truth of the matter is, 
Some of us already come front loaded with problems. We drag problems from before we even met our spouse into our relationship and it can take on a life of its own. We get hurt and there is a cycle that comes with being hurt. But more often than not, that cycle has not run its course properly before you say, I do, or I want to. Now, this is not to say that the only hurt comes before you get married. The truth of the matter is we can do a good job of hurting each other in a relationship. Oh, yeah, the very one that you stood there and promised most of the time before God and family and community that you would love, honor, and cherish ends up being the very one that you hurt and hurt in a very, very bad way. It's just part of being who we are. Guess what, folks? I'm going to release you from something right now. People let other people down. All right? It's normal. There is no one perfect. I don't care how good he looked in his tux or how pure and chaste she looked in her gown. Nobody is perfect. And we all have issues that we have to deal with. And marriage can be a boiler sometimes, a crock pot, where stuff is just simmering. Every now and then, I don't know about a crock pot, depends on how much you put in there, I guess, but I know a ball, if it gets too hot, will boil over. I know that. We get hurt. Anybody here ever been hurt? You raise your hand. You been... Ooh. Anybody naturally who's been hurt is going to eventually get angry for being hurt. Oh yeah, you got a right to be angry. Somebody mistreated me. Somebody abused me. Somebody made a fool out of me. Somebody lied to me. Somebody took advantage of me. I'm probably stepping on some toes on here, in here, but that's all right. Hopefully we can get you to a place where this is no longer the problem that it is. Before long, your anger follows a natural course. I'm hurt, and the more I mull over this situation, actually, when I get hurt, I find that there's a natural cycle that I follow, natural cycle. I find myself hurt, and I get sad because of it. Some people stick right there. You've been walking around sad and depressed, over what somebody did to you, and it may have happened to you years ago. Years ago, but you can't get yourself out of that position until you can get the healing done in this situation. You're not going to be ready to be involved in a healthy relationship. You may be in a relationship, but that doesn't mean it's a healthy relationship. And love has the... Um, uh, the perception of love, let me say that. Romance makes you think that you can solve all the problems folk have. And I'm here to tell you right now that that just isn't the case. You meet somebody who's hurt to the core like this, and you're dealing with them, yes, love them, but they need to get some healing before you go and say, I do. Otherwise, it becomes an issue in your relationship and it starts taking control of everything that's going on. Some of it is very serious. I don't want to make light of it. Now, some of it is abuse that happened when you were a child and you, you just can't push yourself off of it. You need some resolution to those situations. Some of it happens when you're in the marriage. It's abuse in the marriage. And you just can't push yourself off that situation. And you need to know how to resolve it. And for Christians, it's even more complex. Because we find ourselves questioning our faith. 
when we're in this situation. You, 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 you say, I, I don't know what's going on emotionally. I'm confused about this because I shouldn't be walking around sad all the time. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I've got joy in me. And so why am I sad all the time? And in fact, not only am I sad, sadness has gone to a whole nother level. I'm not just sad. I'm miserable. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely by any definition, you'll meet the clinical diagnosis, diagnosis of depression. And what you really don't understand is that the sadness that you had has turned into another stage in the cycle that's called grief. You're grieving just as if you lost somebody dear, because you did. Yeah, that relationship was dear to you. There is a scene in the Bible that brings us an example of how to start dealing with these kinds of situations. It's a strange scene to get us to this point. Because I want you to know that the process you go through is completely normal. But when I tell you the things that you have to do to get out of it, you might not believe me. And so it's going to step on some toes today. All right? I got a clip I want you to see right now. She's a sinner, an adulteress. She's going to be punished according to the law. Take her to the master. <laughs> master. Yes, master. Yes, master. Shame on you. Stone her. Stone her. Stone her. Master, what should we do? This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. She should be punished according to the law. What do you say? Answer, Master. We want to know your opinion. Yes, tell us. Is it right to kill her? He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Where are your accusers? Is there anyone here who's condemned you? Uh, no. No one. Then neither do I condemn you. Uh, Go. And sin no more. This woman was caught doing something wrong, but she was wrong t too, because it should have been two folk on the wall. I think the simple instruction that Jesus Christ gave in that video told him that you could be standing on this wall too. He who is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. 
when we look at that simple instruction from Jesus Christ, we realize that there's no one among us who is sinless, who hasn't done something wrong. And yet, all the time, we stand in judgment of other folk. All the time, we're picking up stones, hurling them at people verbally, hurling them at people emotionally. I got news for you, y'all. Those stones hurt. And folk in here are sitting here right now, victims having been struck by those stones. And before long, when you get in a situation like that, when husbands and wives find themselves in a situation where all they're doing is hurling stones at each other, all they're doing is fighting and fussing all the time, or worse yet, they've gotten to a dangerous place in their marriage where there's hurt and there's nothing said about it. Nothing is said about it. They've gotten to a place where they pass one another like ships in the night. Or worse than that, they move on like nothing ever happened. Without ever dealing with the core problem, it's still there. We just acting like it's not there. Oh, it'll put you in a bad space. And if you are the victim under those circumstances, the cycle is still running. Oh yeah, your, your, your wound has turned into deeper hurt, depression. Before long, that's going to turn into anger. And it's the anger that eventually will find you moving into another neighborhood that you're in, on anger avenue. And if you stay there long enough, you're gonna find yourself adopting the same attitude the same attitude as the folk who live in that uh, neighborhood, and you're going to find that you've become bitter. The Bible speaks in a number of places of this thing called a root of bitterness. And when a root of bitterness sets in, that's a problem. And if you got a root of bitterness in your relationship, you got a problem. It's got to be dug up. It's got to be put out. It's got to be gotten rid of. This cycle that you're going on, the dangerous part is when you get to resentment. Can you imagine you can't stand the sight of the person you marry? You can't stand to hear him talking. Don't call me. The one you love so much, the one you swore your life to, y'all even got a child. And you can't stand him no more. Don't call me. Got his number blocked. It's a problem. And let me tell you, when you're in that situation, the danger comes for you because that's when you reach down and you pick up a stone. Because you want to get back at the person who has hurt you. And that's what you spend your time doing. You're getting ready. And guess what? If it's more than one hurt, every time something happens, you pick up a stone. Some of us have picked up so many stones. Some of us are walking around, but we're confused because we're believers. And we know we can't throw stones at folk. And so what do we do? We know we can't throw stones, but yet, said, we're still scared to drop them. We're sitting here right now. We can't throw it. And we can't drop it. And so some folk come in here Sunday after Sunday. Week after week. Year after year. Carrying all those heavy stones. Don't know what to do with it. And you want to come in here some Sunday. And you want me to preach a sermon that says, throw the stone. You got a bullseye on somebody's head and you want me to say, it's okay. Go ahead and let it fly. Bust his head open to the white meat is what you want me to tell you. And I'm here to tell you, you know, you got somebody's picture in front of you. You know who it is, the one who used to smile like angels. Now you can't stand to see her or him coming. You got a bullseye on him. 
and you want to throw this stone at them, and I came to tell you today, don't throw your stone. I came to tell you, do not throw that stone. Do not throw your stone. But let me tell you what happens in relationships. When we are resentful, when we've gone through this process, we're wounded, we're angry, we're depressed, we've reached the point of resentment. When we're in a relationship with somebody like that, and there's some folk in here right now, some folk in here right now, and they know it. They know it. They're afraid to say it. They're even afraid to acknowledge that they're in that place right now. But it's true. It's never going to get any better until you do some drastic things. Because know this, first point, where resentment lives, intimacy begins to die. Oh, where resentment lives, intimacy begins to die. What do you mean, Reverend Small? Intimacy is simply defined as being fully known. That's all. We always think about intimacy in the context of, of, of marriage and sex. But an intimacy is much deeper than that. It's much deeper than physical contact. Intimacy is much bigger than that. Being fully known means I understand and know what's going on with you. You are not afraid to reveal yourself to me, your true self to me. You're not hiding. You're not covering up. You're not every time I ask you what's going on or if you're all right, you say, yeah, knowing it's not true. When I see that look in your eye and I know there's a problem and I question you about it, when there is bitterness and resentment, I won't tell you. You know why? Because I refuse to reveal myself. And you can't be in a complete marriage or relationship with somebody when you're not revealing yourself, when you're not intimate. With, that's the blessing of a marriage. The blessing of a marriage is I've got somebody God has given me who I can be completely me with. I don't have to cover me up, hide me. I don't have to protect myself. I can be as goofy as I am. And she'll love me and receive me for, and likewise. But when there's resentment because of lack of forgiveness, I refuse to do it. Let me, let me tell you how you live like that. You're just going through the motions. You're going to work. You're coming home. You're passing like two ships in the night. You're hiding stuff. Why? Because if I let you see this, it reveals too much of who I am or what I'm thinking right now. And you know what? That's tiring. That's exhausting. It's exhausting to live like that. And if you're in here right now and you've been living like that, you are exhausted. Just trying to have a relationship, playing these games with one another. Acting like everything is all right when it's not. When it's not, you're exhausted. I intimacy means any situation, marriage. You won't even reveal yourself in parenting. You won't reveal yourself in friendships. You won't reveal yourself in employment. It jades every aspect of your life. You're protected. It's like a sheath over you. All because you won't forgive. Nobody knows the true you, even though you went before God and your community and said, I promise to be all I can be to this person. You find yourself in a position where you can't do it or you won't do it because of pain. Look at this. Matthew, everybody. Matthew 18, 21, and 35. I mean, 21, 21 let's read that. I want to I read portions of it for you. And if you're looking for that scripture passage for that video clip I just showed you, it's John chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. John chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. That's the passage for you. You'll go and you'll find what Jesus told her that um, he forgave her. He forgave her when she found herself standing there. How do we get to forgiveness when it hurts so bad? How do we get to forgiveness when it's been hurting so long? 
How do we get to forgiveness when it's a legitimate hurt? This is not a contrived hurt. This is somebody took my heart, pulled it out, stomped on it, jumped up and down on it, gave it back to me, and laughed at me. It's that kind of hurt. It's a for real hurt. And even under those circumstances, y'all, Jesus is saying, you have a responsibility. You can't stay there. You can't take on a different way of living just because you've been hurt. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Verse 21 says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, this is ironic. We had this in Bible study this week. Lord, how often should I forgive someone? who has sinned against me. Seven times? You know, Peter said that because it seems like, uh, let, me, let me give you this example. If Daryl and I, and Daryl's a pretty big dude, if Daryl came up to me and slapped me for no reason, after I got up, <laughs> yeah, the Bible says, I'm supposed, you know, I'm, I forgive him. I forgive you, Dad, for slapping the taste out of my mouth. And so Peter says, if this happens, how many times should I forgive Dad? And, and Peter asked incredulously, like, should I forgive him seven times? In other words, if Dad decided he wanted to slap me six more times, am I supposed to forgive him every Single times, that's what Peter said. Peter said, uh, in his question, Dante, Peter saying, Jesus, you got to be kidding. That I'm going to forgive him seven times for doing me like that, and yet I'm looking in the eyes of somebody out here who's been mistreated. That many times by somebody you've been taken advantage of, that many times by somebody, and Peter's asking the question for you, how many times do you have to forgive somebody who's been mistreating you, who knows they've been mistreating you, been slapping you emotionally? How many times do you have to forgive them? And Jesus' answer is, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven. Now, I don't want you to get lost on the math. What Jesus is saying is you have to forgive an infinite number of times. You keep forgiving over and over and over again. You keep forgiving. And look, I'm seeing right here some people who know that if you marry, you will be forgiving somebody 70 times seven. Oh yeah, it's a continuous thing. If you are truly mad, the problem is we get to the point where we're just stuck on resentment and I'm not gonna move off this spot. That's why divorce court is so busy right now because people will not move past forgiveness. They won't. They will not give. Now, you say, but some things folk do, you can't forgive them. I don't think that Jesus would say that. I don't think that Jesus would say he's not familiar with the circumstances of life. I don't think that Jesus would say he's never been lied on, beaten, falsely accused, mistreated, crucified. Come on, you can go ahead and put whatever you got on there too. I don't think Jesus would say he's never experienced those things because the truth of the matter is he has experienced everything we've experienced. God has given you, God has given you a gift that you're not aware of in terms of dealing with this forgiveness and this problem we have. You wouldn't call it a gift. When you reach this point, you, 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 you probably don't feel like you've been blessed. But I'm here to tell you that you have been. The gift that God gives you to resolve the problem of lack of forgiveness is brokenness. Brokenness. When you find yourself as raggedy as ragged can be, when you find, 
that your relationship is in shambles, that you can't be the kind of parent you want to be, you can't be the kind of friend, daughter, whatever you want to be. When you find yourself in that situation, when you're on the bottom, when you're just flat out broken, Some of us say, I'm here now, I'm going to stay here. I'm just broken. I'm, I'm, I never get married again. I never look for anybody. But the truth of the matter is, it's, it's at that point of brokenness that God can start healing you. That's where the healing comes. See, when you're still walking around mad with your stone in your hand, looking for somebody to throw, it's hard to get through to you. But it's when you actually drop your stone. When I drop my stone, when I let my stone fall to the ground, it's an acknowledgement that I'm in a place where I can't figure this out myself. I'm broken. My stone won't solve it. You can throw the stone and you still can't figure it out yourself. Throwing the stone won't bring you back to the place you want to be. It will not. You think it'll make you feel better. Ask anybody that's ever thrown a stone. They made a whole movie about it called Waiting to Exhale. She burned up all his clothes and everything else. She didn't feel no better. She didn't feel no better behind that. I don't care what they say. You can, you know, I bust the windows out your car. Don't make you feel no better. And then you got a case. Yeah, it only, don't throw the rock. Throwing the rock is busting the windows out your car. Throwing the rock is burning up the clothes. It don't make you feel no better. Drop your stone. Drop your stone, all right? Brokenness is not going to go away. Some of us believe we can just ignore it. Just ignore it, and before long, it's going to go away. Yeah. Or some of us, even worse, think that we can cover it up with accomplishment and stuff. We can fix it by, by moving to the next professional milestone. And if I get this next promotion, then she'll forget it. Or, or if I buy this house. Or if I buy a $5 million ring. Uh oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to bring Kobe up in this thing. But, 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 but some of us, look, look. A $5 million dollar ring don't make it better. No, no, you still find yourself in a ragged situation even after you buy a $5 million dollar ring, however much it costs. More than you can get at Lorch. I can tell you that right now. You can buy all the Lorch. <laughs> Lorches. Yeah, it's not going to make it better just trying to act like it didn't happen. No, some of you have honestly chosen forgiveness. Some of you have reached a point where you say, I can't live like this no more, and so I'm, I'm going to forgive this person. And the hurt, most hurtful thing is a double hurt. When you decide you're going to forgive them, you go to them and you say, I, I, I forgive you for what you've done. Uh, give me a call. You, you haven't talked to them in a year. You've reached a point where you're ready to reconcile this thing. You call them, and they don't call you back. Oh, that's like pouring salt on the wound. Even though you've reached a point, and you get mad all over again because they didn't respond to your forgiveness offer, even though they were the one that hurt you. You did this to me. I'm trying to forgive you, and now you treat me like this again. And so you find yourself in an awful situation. So newsflash for you. Newsflash. It's only true forgiveness when you forgive regardless of their response. It's only true forgiveness when you forgive regardless of their response because the truth of the matter is your forgiveness while it has the ancillary benefit of maybe making things right between you and the person what you really want to do is make sure things are right between you and God 
And when you get things right between you and God, then you got a better, you're in a better place to straighten things out between other folks. Because you walk around now, if you've never even gotten to the point of forgiveness, if you're acting like something didn't happen, if you've never gone to this place, a story of a preacher. who talked about the act of forgiveness. He and his wife of 10 years broke up because he was a pastor of the church. He and his wife of 10 years broke up because he was having an affair with her best friend. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a hurtful situation. That's a hurtful situation. It's not a unique situation. It's a hurtful situation. Because regardless of your job and position and everything you're in, everybody's got issues. And sometimes the job you're in exacerbates your issues. But she was honest enough to admit, even though he did her wrong, even though they separated, even though they lived apart for a period of time, he was, she was enough, woman enough to admit that she had been emotionally distant before they even got married. And in fact, when they married, it only worsened her anger. And what she was most mad about was the fact that in his job as a preacher, in the first 10 years of their marriage, they had moved 13 times. And she said every time they moved, she went through this same cycle of being mad, but she wouldn't throw a rock down because she could function in the mad. But they were not intimate with one another. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about knowing each other. I'm talking about talking to each other. I'm talking about how was your day. I'm talking about what you want for dinner. I'm talking about can we go to dinner? I'm talking about, can we go away for the weekend? I'm talking about intimate. I don't want to be with you for no long time. Over the weekend, I ain't texting you unless I have to. Why you email me this? I'm talking about that kind of intimacy, that playful back and forth. Man, romances ought to be abounding right now with all the little stuff that people can connect. I remember when Karen and I first got together, if I didn't walk down from my apartment at Martin Luther King down to the Winn-Dixie, to get on the phone because I ain't had no phone at the house. First of all, I had to get a quarter <laughs> from somewhere to go down and call her just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. That kind, and did it often. Cold, hot. Walked down there and hoped she was at home. <laughs> or else I wasted a quarter. Showed up. It's Karen now. What? No. It ain't no. Well, I mean, if she came back in 30 minutes, I'd have to spend another quarter <laughs> to call her. And now, and now, all day long, I can text her. Hey, how you doing? I can call her. I can email her. So many different ways. Instant messenger. So many different ways that I can just communicate if we are at that point. And so with all these things in place, you ought to be really pouring on the I want to be with you kind of thing because you really can almost stay connected all the time. But if you're upset and bitter at somebody, you're not going to take advantage of those circumstances. No, 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 no. No, you got to forgive somebody. Jesus is saying, I forgave. When you point the finger at Jesus and say, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus is saying, I do. I do understand what you're going through. And regardless of how they respond to you, forgiveness is only true when it doesn't matter how they respond. All right. In the parable, it seems as though we're, uh, there's a parable that Jesus talked about. It's in that same passage that I gave you and. And in Matthew, 
It's the rest of that passage from 23 to 35. That's Matthew chapter 18. It's the parable of the king and the debtor. You know this parable where the king calls in a debtor. And the man owed him, according to this, path, this reading of the scripture, the king had his debtor brought in who had borrowed some money from him. And one of his debtors owed him millions of dollars, but he couldn't pay it. And so the master said that he should be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to satisfy his debt. But the man fell down on his knees before the master and begged, please be patient with me and I'll pay you. I'm reading the scripture now. Then the master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave the debt, not just released him, but forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to his fellow servants who owed him a few thousand dollars, grabbed him by the throat, demanded instant payment. You know this passage. The fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me, he said, and I'll pay it. But his creditor couldn't, wouldn't wait. So he had the man arrested, put in jail, until the payment could be made in full. The servants saw him do this, and they ran back to the mouth, to the king. And they said to him, the man that you forgave the debt didn't do the same thing for the person who owed him a debt. And so the king called the man in, put him in prison, and had him tortured until he paid his entire debt. And that's what you and I face the possibility of when we don't give back what has been given to us. Now, when you look at that story, when you look at that story, when you listen to that parable, how many of you put yourself in the position of the king when it comes to forgiving somebody a debt? Yeah, the natural inclination is, yeah, I, that means I, I, as the king, as the one who's old, I've got to treat folk the way that I've been treated, right? If you look at it like that, you're looking at it wrong. You're looking at it wrong. Let me tell you why. We are always the debtors. The king is always the Lord. We're never in the place of the Lord. You got to remember that. That's why you ought to be able to forgive somebody because you're always in debt. And when you stand here and you won't forgive somebody, even though you've been forgiven, anybody that's come to the front of a church and said, forgive me, Lord, for I have seen got to recognize that they are debtor. Every day you get up, you got to remember, I'm a debtor. I'm just saved by grace. And so when you deny somebody the same grace that you've been given on a daily basis, on a regular basis, you've been given eternally, then how can you be saying to yourself you're living a Christ-like lifestyle? So these are the principles to remember as I get out here today. As you forgive, remember, forgiveness is free. This is as you go home and you start rebuilding your relationship. You go wherever you're going to go and rebuild your relationship with somebody. Know these, these three central things. Forgiveness is free, but trust is earned. All right? Just because you've forgiven somebody doesn't mean they don't have to build their trust up again. Doesn't mean they don't have to walk right, treat you right, talk right, carry themselves properly. They've got to earn your trust again. Yeah, you've been directed to forgive them, but they too have a responsibility to make sure they don't tap all over your heart again. Trust has to be, must be earned. Not only must trust be earned, forgiveness doesn't excuse their behavior, it prevents their behavior from destroying your life. All right? Forgiveness does not excuse. You say, how can I forgive them? They killed somebody I love. How can I forgive them? They got such and such going on over there. How can I forgive them? That's not forgivable. You're not forgiving them to say what you've done is all right. 
You're forgiving them so you can say to them, I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm better. I don't have to be swollen. I don't have to be mad. I don't have to mess up all my other relationships with folk. I don't have to be a poor daughter. I don't have to be a poor mama. I don't have to be any of these things because of what you did to me. That's why I got to forgive you. Because if I don't forgive you, I'm messing myself up. Forgiveness is for you. Not, not for them. Not for them. It's for you. And the last thing is, offering forgiveness does not mean that they win. Some of us have that mistaken belief that, that, that just because I say I'm sorry, or I mean I forgive you, then whatever they've done to you, they win. They cheated on me, and I forgave them. So they win. It validates what they did. He beat me up. I forgave him. Make him think he was right. She did such and such. It doesn't mean the other person wins. When you forgive somebody, it means Christ wins. When you forgive somebody, it means that Christ Jesus has won. When you forgive somebody, you absolutely validate the statement that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Christ reigns supreme. When you say, I forgive you, you are elevating Christ to be in the difference in your life. When you say, I forgive you, you're saying, I'm dead to my old self. And I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Somebody has been living in defeat for too long. You've been not only beat up by the world, you've been beating yourself up. Today is the day. Today is the day. I can assure you today that Christ Jesus has forgiven you. But if you have never accepted the gift that he's given then it's just like leaving a present under the Christmas tree on Christmas Day, unopened, all year long. It's sitting there with your name on it. Inside of it is eternity. But you leave it sitting there all the time. I'm here to tell you, you can pick it up today. You can grab it. That gift is available to you today. When are you going to pick it up? When are you going to start moving forward with your life? When are you going to stop sitting and spinning? Don't worry about anybody sitting around you today because I'm here to tell you, they've been through what you've been through or worse. You got to make decisions for yourself. Regardless of what the world thinks, you got to get you happy. Back to the Lord. That's your responsibility today. I'm here to offer you a relationship with the master of the universe. I'm here to offer you a relationship with the God who created everything. I'm here to offer you today, your trip to heaven can start right now. Your eternal destination begins today, all because of Jesus Christ, because he was willing to come and live not just being willing to live because he was willing to live and die. Not just being willing to die, but because God loved him enough, he resurrected him. Because of that, he can take somebody as imperfect as me. Somebody who daily has to ask him to forgive him for all the wrong I've done. Somebody who equips me and fits me to be able to stand here and extend to you an invitation to be a part of his family. He uses me. He can use me. Uses me. To tell you he loves you. Won't you accept his gift today? I told you Gabe was going to come and sing today. I told you. I want him to sing today. He needs to sing today. Because God has given that to him today. Because greater is he. Who is in you. Than he who is in the world. And while he stands and sings this song. The doors of our church are wide open. 
Whosoever will, let them come. Come on. We've been waiting on you. Well, there you have it. My prayer is that this sermon, this message has been a blessing to you. If you desire more information about 45th Street or any information you need about the Lord, I invite you to visit us at our website, 45bc.org, or come see us in our church, in our church home at 7600 Division Avenue. Again, my name is Andre Sparks, and I can't wait to see you. And so you can find out why we're striving to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. God bless you. Take care.